So, so Mike Smith knows this about me. I've, I've got some, uh, I've got some pettiness in my spirit, Thomas. I'm trying to get better, but you know, there's some things that really <laughs> annoy me. And one of the things that annoys me is that when a team builder, whether it's a head coach or a general manager, comes in and doesn't have respect for the process or doesn't seem to, seems to come in with a little, a little too much of a, a, a chest puffed out unnecessarily. And so that's the thing that annoys me about Urban Meyer, seemingly. College guy coming in, got all the answers. I don't think that flies in the NFL. Just what's your experience from, what's your experience with these college guys, whether it's a head coach or a general manager coming in? Wait, okay, go ahead, Mike. Where, am I softening? No, 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 it? wait. Am I softening? <laughs> Yeah, big time, big time. Oh my god. Oh my god. Wait, wait you acting like we actually interview like we're not talking to family. You act like we interviewing somebody that you got to sugarcoat this thing with Thomas. This dude act like Urban Meyer stole something from him. I don't know if it's the Ohio State days or what, but ever since Urban Meyer got yesterday, this dude said he said that Urban Meyer lives somewhere between this is your predecessor Bobby Petrino way and Nick Saban Boulevard that he ain't built for this league. And I'm just like, Michael, I remember, I'm old enough to remember 2000, Thomas, I know you do too. 2000, Belichick wasn't a college guy, but even though he had made the playoffs in Cleveland, people were saying the same thing about how he was coming in and wasn't built to, made to be a head coach. I just think it's too early to write off Urban Meyer the way that Michael Holly has, has been doing since he got hired, and now more so than ever, since there's all these stories about dysfunction coming out. Way to soften that up, Michael. Ask it a neutral question. You ain't neutral on Urban Meyer. <laughs> okay, I'm not neutral, but I but I want to give Thomas an opportunity. I want to give Thomas an opportunity to address it in the way that he will, without my biases. Okay. okay, let me start by saying this, and this is not a lighthearted preface. Urban and I have always gotten along, and he's treated me respectfully. That said, you cannot avoid what is always a topic of conversation within the NFL amongst general manager, player personnel people, and even coaches. There's always going to be a jealousy and an insecurity about a man like Urban Meyer, Nick Saban, Chip Kelly, whoever they are coming in with a lot of cash in from the college game, stepping into a league that is really steeped in tradition and a, and a tight-knit group, no question about that. So there are a lot of people out there looking at Urban Meyer and have looked at a lot of college coaches who have stepped in this game the way that Urban has, hoping for him not to succeed. Unfortunate as it is, it is mm. the way it is. And you've been reading it, whether it's Lock and Four reporting it or other people talking about it, there are a lot of people on their edges, the edges of their seats trying to figure out what it's going to take for Urban to look at USD and go and repl replace Clay Helton there. <laughs> and I will be really interested to see how that plays out. Again, hey, I'm Michael, think about this, both Michaels. Urban Meyer knows what he's doing. He is a very, very good football coach. Whether he fits in or wants to fit in with this pro game right now, that's not for us, I guess, to answer at this point. It will be really interesting to see how the organization revolves around him. And if they get behind him, or do they continue to throw darts quietly? Because he will not, I guarantee this, someone of his stature and someone of, of his uh, confidence, he's not going to take lightly to cancers within the room or mutiny within the room. Believe me, there will be some interesting sales down the road if he starts seeing that. Well, let me ask you this. And that's a, that's a great answer, Thomas. What do you think, you know, my, my, uh, my resentment toward Urban and my jealousy, okay, maybe I'm jealous, I don't know, uh, of Urban aside, what do you think his biggest challenge is going from college to the pros? Is it the obvious or is there something, is there something nuanced there that, that maybe I'm missing? Well, first of all, he can't compete with you style-wise, so you don't have to worry about that. He's not wearing nicer clothes and more style than you. Make sure you guys know that. We'll move that Thank aside. You. you know, Thank as far as the, the nuances, as far as trying to be, you know, coming from a college and being an omnipotent college coach and stepping into being, you know, the, the answer in Jacksonville, I think what's happening here is, again, you have people that are looking at it saying the best way that an organization should be set up is a very good partnership between the head coach and the general manager. And as much as possible, it's shoulder to shoulder. We've seen it and talked about it time and again. 
Urban Meyer, I can imagine, like other coaches coming in, remember this. They did not have to work with a general manager in college. They had an AD and a president. President, of course, they respected, but rarely had discussions with him. The AD, it didn't matter who that AD is. I mean, no one really cared who the ADs were. They, they, did, they had no decision-making ability. Now he's got to work side by side with Trek Balky and crew. That becomes complicated. I don't know how it's going. I've not talked to anyone there. What I will say is that it, it is complicated, and you have a lot of people tiptoeing around wondering how to handle an omnipotent head coach because they, that person has not been in the pro ranks knowing the give and takes of team building with another person. Interesting going from omnipotence and uh, realizing that you're not omniscient uh, at this level. So we'll see how it plays out. It's still just one game. Uh, Belichick, Patriots. Last time we talked to you, I think, I, I'm sorry, the kind of, days kind of run together. Might have still been a question as to who was going to start. And I think since we last it talked was. to you, Cam has yeah. been released and it is Mac Jones. Looks solid in his first time out. He may have a win his first time out, if not for uh, both running backs fumbling. But, um, you know, but Harris is fumble inside the red zone as they were going in. What would you see from Mac Jones? And for that matter, Tua Tungavaloa. Uh, really, that matchup with former Alabama quarterbacks, the jury's still out on Tua outside of Miami. Well, let's start with Mac. I mean, the, the reality is Mac handled it with poise like we thought he would. He had a really good understanding. Of course, he's got one of the best, if not the best, offensive coordinators in the league who is going to get him ready. I loved it. I know it was a small thing, and they, they highlighted it. When he flipped the ball after he got his first touchdown and he, and he just kind of cast off saying, oh, I got many more of those to do. Let me just focus on this. Yeah, team that was cool. Building with. I love that. It is so Patriot-esque. I get that. And it probably irritates a lot of other people. I understand that. I just, I love his poise and his savvy and his ability to move around and be calm through it all. That's a great indication of what's, what's to come. You know, Thomas, uh, I, I want to stick with quarterbacks, not Patriots quarterbacks. Oh, well, well, what about uh, just? Wait, I'm sorry, real quick. Oh, yeah, you have one more. Tua, yeah, yeah, thoughts Who's on the other Tua? one? Yeah, yeah, thoughts on Tua. Tua. Oh yeah, Tua. Yeah, look, I mean, again, Tua. He's going to be as ready as possible, given who they are as a staff. And Brian Flores, like another Patriot guy, is going to have him as ready as possible. He had his ups and downs. I know there's still a lot of questions out there about are they going to go forward with him? What happens in the next few weeks if things don't? really thrive as you want him to thrive? Will they be in the Deshaun Watson uh, sweepstakes more than who knows? The reality is he's a hell of an athlete who moves around and has versatility to him. He's got to, of course, be very proper about his decision making, and that will come with time. But as a, as a team executive and as a co-team builder, believe me, that patience in that situation wears thin when you're losing games, and this is all about wins in this league. You and I know that. All right, so so Thomas, let's talk about uh, quarterbacks, uh, that, uh, young quarterbacks who are a little bit more advanced than, than Tua and Mac. I'm talking about Lamar Jackson and Baker Mayfield. What goes into an organization saying, all right, we're going to go forward with this big contract right now, or we're going to wait? And just from an organizational standpoint and how a player perceives it when you're just kind of in that waiting game. Well, you're referring to uh, Baker at this point, right? I'm sorry. Baker, that's... Yeah, Baker Mayfield. You were saying Baker. Yeah, Baker yes, and Lamar of Jackson. Course. Yeah, yeah I, I heard. Okay, so Baker first. Yeah, look, I mean, my own interaction with the people that I know in this whole situation is there is no question about it that Andrew Barry is committed to him, and we know that Baker's going to be the guy there. That's what I have heard, and those are the rumblings that are very strong. They want to work with him. I wouldn't be surprised within the season that there is legit – headway in the negotiation whether it gets done or not i don't know i just have a, a strong feeling they're going to work to try to get this sealed up it's a, it's an important time for him of course i mean it'll be really really interesting to see how all these pieces fall into place you know money wise and what what's going to happen with baker's contract leading into lamar's contract are these guys both 45 to or 40 to 45 million or 44 to 48 million i i can't wait because i remember sitting in my seat when we signed Matt Ryan a few years ago to a $30 million contract, I have people within the organization and outside the organization say, T, are you sure? Are you really sure you should do that? A month or two later, he's eclipsed. That's the way this business goes. Hey, last question we got for you, Thomas, is um, 
whether it was Burrow to Chase, uh, Hertz to Smith, or Tangavaloa to Waddle, uh, the reunions went well week one. Uh, you've always been great at identifying and staying ahead of uh, trends throughout the league. And even the aforementioned Urban Meyer tried to do it with uh, Trevor Lawrence and, you know, not a receiver, but he was, you know, working him as one, Travis Etienne. Do you see uh, more and more teams in an effort to, because people have always drafted uh, young receivers to grow with young quarterbacks, but do you see them maybe going into the talent pool that is their, that quarterback's alma mater and doing more of these reunions? Or is this just coincidence that, uh, you know, the best players happen to come out of the same schools and at the time, uh, that these teams were picking to support their quarterbacks. I think it's multi-layered. I think you, you have a point here. When you're sitting there setting up your receiver group and you have a quarterback and you start thinking how you're going to pair, that does play into it. It's, it's another factor that you would consider. It's not the end-all, be-all. But it does give you a comfort level. And when you think your quarterback, especially your young quarterback, has a comfort level with his, his receivers, running backs and tight ends, and that they can continue to thrive together, you do anything you can as an organization to help make your quarterback feel comfortable. Again, not to jot dive back into the day, the day, so to speak. We did all in our power. When we traded for Tony Gonzalez, we knew Matt Ryan would thrive, not because he's from the same spot. We knew he was going to thrive having Tony Gonzalez as a very, very high percentage shot underneath to help Matt evolve. This is about quarterbacks evolving. Receiver's going to come and go. They're great. They're, you have to have amazing ones. Your quarterback is going to take you into to, to many years into the future, and you better make sure that they're operating early and operating well early. All right, Thomas Dimitrov, man. man. We always appreciate your insight and your knowledge. Uh, really classing up the program, bringing some, uh, bringing some intelligence <laughs> to this little space here. Well, evidently I wasn't when I did when I named Aaron Rodgers as top quarterback. But you know, Michael, look, that's another conversation. Well, another. All and right, and speaking of another conversation, I hope we can do it again soon. You guys are great. Yeah, let's do Mike, it again. Great seeing you, brother. Hey, thanks for watching Brother from Another on YouTube. Make sure you hit subscribe before you leave and be sure to watch us 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Peacock. Appreciate you.